today I'll be talking uh, about my research and my work on detecting conscious awareness in behavioral non-responsive patients after severe brain injury. In the spread of the wonderful talks that we are hearing today, my work uh, stands at the side of research and uh, developing novel methods to understand what the preserved mental capacities of patients who are, especially those in, in severe brain injury, are, and looking in particular at conscious awareness. So philosophers have debated for centuries the definition of consciousness, but the simple aphorism by Descartes, I think, therefore I am, cuts to the heart of the matter. We all know that we are conscious. In this statement, there is an agent, um, the individual who expresses their consciousness through language. But what about patients who after severe brain injury become entirely non-responsive and therefore cannot express their consciousness through language or behavior. So we'll, I'll be discussing today about some advanced neuroimaging methods that I have developed to detect consciousness and understand preserve mental um, life in some in proportion of some patients and discuss some ethical implications around this work. So patients can become entirely behavior non-responsive after severe brain injury. And the group that I will be focusing on today are those patients who fall into, have an acute brain injury, fall into a coma, and then uh, progress to a state that is clinically diagnosed as vegetative state. Uh, in this state, patients do not respond to commands delivered by the clinical staff uh, on repeated occasions. And appear and are thought to lack awareness of themselves and of the environment. So in the clinic, the consciousness in particular is diagnosed with regards to two dimensions, arousal and awareness, so uh, eyes opening, sleep-wake cycles, um, other certain reflective, um, reflexive uh, behaviors, and awareness, which is the ability to respond to commands and meaningfully respond to stimulation. In normal consciousness, both of these dimensions are preserved. By contrast, in the vegetative state patients, we see that arousal can be uh, quite high, as in there will be periods of sleep-wake um, cycles, there will be eyes opening, um, but awareness is at least behaviorally not present. The individual does not appear to be uh, responding to commands or meaningfully to uh, in, in their environment. And uh, this is one of the patients that I saw, um, and he basically he summarizes this category of patients who are in a vegetative state. Uh, they cannot follow commands with their behavior. Um, in 2006, uh, Adrian Nguyen and colleagues at the University of Cambridge at the time showed that uh, some patients could uh, that fulfilled internationally agreed uh, upon criteria for the vegetative state could nevertheless follow commands uh, by performing mental tasks, in particular mental imagery, such as here, relative to healthy controls when inside the scanner. Uh, and this is uh, showing a patient who was um, diagnosed as vegetative state at the time when instructed to either imagine um, to play tennis in their in their mind or to navigate around the rooms of their home the the brain activity of the patient was indistinguishable from that of controls and um, when I started my work with Adrian Owen I wanted to know more about in, in this patients so what can we say about the preserved mental life that they might harbor so obviously we can say that this this patient uh, can imagine to perform certain actions but that really doesn't tell us much with regards to how much they understand of their environment. So can such patients pay attention to their environment, for example? This, in uh, understanding this would enable us to say whether a patient who is behavior non-responsive can uh, understand what a doctor is saying despite the cacophony of sounds around them in the busy hospital world, or whether a patient knows that uh, their family uh, has come and stayed by the bedside all night. And to address this question, um, as a, I'm a cognitive neuroscientist and, and my expertise is in developing uh, assessments and protocols for looking at uh, the brain capacity. So in order to address this question, I wanted to look at cognition in response to real world events. So 
one of my patients here being wheeled by his father, I wondered what he can understand of situations like this, um, dynamic environments, um, lots of different uh, things happening around him, how much he, he can understand of that. And with patients who are severely brain injured, when, when developing assessments, we want assessments that are very short because patients can be fatigued easily, naturally engaging without instructions. So we want um, types of tests that can draw the, the residual attention out rather than the patient having to struggle to attend to arbitrary commands. And also to tap into different cognitive systems. Um, some patients in these states will present as a black box. We won't know if they hear, if they can perceive sound or images, and therefore we want to have multisensory types of uh, stimulation that can tap into different systems and potentially tap into their residual um, capacities. And to, to address this question, I turned to movies, because movies of great directors, such as, for example, um, Alfred Hitchcock and others, are by their very nature uh, designed to give us all a common experience through the engagement of our attention uh, and executive function. And when we uh, do this, we have a common experience that I wonder if I can measure that, uh, what that looks like in the brain, then we can see if individual patients uh, have similar experiences to complex uh, information. And prior to my work, uh, colleagues in Israel had shown that when healthy individuals watch very engaging movies, it is as if our brains synchronize. So in the, in the brain activity, we will see that the ebb and flow um, of activity are very, very similar across different individuals. What we didn't know at this point is what part of this activity represents conscious understanding. So this is a busy slide, but uh, just taking you through it uh, in, in a very kind of diagrammatic manner. Um, I had uh, health individuals going to the scanner to validate uh, the paradigm uh, they're basically trying to understand what parts of this brain activity represent conscious understanding. And we saw that when people watch this uh, short eight minute movie by Alfred Hitchcock, depicting a young boy who is uh, playing with a gun, he doesn't know it's real and is uh, sh nearly shooting people around him. Uh, health individuals show very synchronized, similar activity across the brain in this region shown in yellow. And then by uh, doing different investigations in, in behavioral groups, independent groups coming into the laboratory to quantify what parts of this movie have to do with conscious attention um, and uh, conscious perception of suspense on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. Then I was able to isolate that parts of the brain in the front of parietal um, cortex shown here in different colors uh, because all the different tasks had consistency in their spatial um, mapping. These parts of the brain were indeed responsible for those um, cognitive and emotional processing of the stimul stimuli in the movie. And to further make sure that this activity in the front of parietal cortex uh, was strictly related to conscious processing, I also had another study when I put uh, healthy individuals in the um, scanner and deeply anesthetized them with propofol with the help of the clinical team. And we saw that deep anesthesia, the activity uh, related to the stimulation in those front of parietal regions is abolished. So these studies, um, and uh, that I'm going through very briefly here, enabled me to establish a signature of um, narrative understanding uh, that is through, through our visual stimuli uh, that is represented in this front of parietal regions, which through a long uh, series of neuropsychological and neuroscience research have been linked to complex cognition and intelligence in humans, and that are different from signatures in sensory, auditory, and visual areas. So then I could use this to uh, test individual patients. So I will describe two patients that were very similar clinically. I've looked at patients who appear to be unconscious. Um, so we have a female of 20 year old has an unknown etiology and has um, been non-responsive for 6.5 years and a male uh, 34 year old, years old has an anoxic brain injury and was non-responsive, thought to lack consciousness for 16 years. And so here is the uh, activity here from the healthy group, which I've shown you before, with a different auditory and visual signatures representing different colors here, uh, pink and blue, and the front of parietal uh, activity in different colors representing the different types of uh, quantifications of this information, all consistently represented in the front of parietal cortex. 
And we expect that individuals uh, who have um, any understanding would have the same uh, pattern in the, from the parietal cortex. So first of all, if we look at uh, the first patient, we saw that we uh, could detect very synchronized activity in auditory cortex in this patient, but none in, in visual or from the parietal regions. And we can't tell from this uh, information whether the patient had their eyes closed or they fell asleep temporarily, and I'll get to that later. But for patient three, we observed highly synchronized activity on auditory and uh, visual regions, but critically, highly synchronized activity in response to the different tasks uh, from three independent groups of health individuals in the front of parietal cortex, suggesting that not only was the patient aware, but also that he could follow the plot and feel suspense uh, on a moment-to-moment -moment basis as healthy individuals. Um, I learned after the study that his father, of the patient I just described, Paul, had been taking his son, Jeff, to the movies. He lived in a long-term care facility in Canada where I carried out some of this work uh, for a, nearly a decade on a weekly basis because this is something they could do together and he thought his son enjoyed it. And he felt extremely validated by the results of the study and uh, said that all the times that he spoke to his son in private, he felt that Jeff could hear him. And needless to say, this was a very rewarding study for me to carry out. And I want to discuss another case, a 19-year-old male who had an anoxic brain injury and was non-responsive for just uh, after his injury for just 2.5 uh, months when I saw him. Um, this patient had his eyes closed. And for this patient, I developed another um, assessment uh, of a consisted of a narrative that was very gripping. Five minutes had a narrative arc, but it was uh, only in the auditory modality. So he didn't require to have his eyes open. So when I did the movie task with him, uh, as I as I've shown you his healthy results before, I saw for the, the patient very uh, robust and you can see his brain looks really healthy as Dr. Amo suggested some, these are some of the you know, most tricky patients that where the brain looks healthy but they present low awareness or no awareness. So very strong activity in the auditory cortex but no activity in, uh, in the visual or from the parietal region. So when I presented him with an audio story, in the healthy group, again, we have this auditory signature and frontoparietal signature. Similarly, he, he shows very robust, similar auditory signature, but also critically, he has a very strong frontoparietal signature to this narrative that we have linked with uh, the processing of the suspense and the cognitive demand, suggesting that he was consciously aware at this time and understood the story that we presented him. This is that patient I just discussed, Juan, with his family. And after um, three months, after the scanning session I described, he recovered self-feeding, talking, and standing with assistance. And I am aware that these patients are in a very small minority, but nevertheless, he did recover function. And uh, to find out more about his state of uh, mental life when we, when he was considered to be in a vegetative state, we brought him back to do a memory assessment of him and asked him, developed um, a test to assess uh, quantitatively his memory of the time in the vegetative state. And what we found out is that Juan could remember, could distinguish the faces of people he had seen relative to the, uh, the assessment team relative to people he hadn't seen. He could remember and pick out some of the assessment items. He gave us detailed information about the experience of going the scanner and so on. So um, briefly then, um, what this uh, studies suggest, and there is a whole a large body of work that I haven't gone in detail here for in the interest of time, is that in some patients which are in the minority, when we're looking at alert behavior, it is as if we're looking at the surface of the water and that the preponderance of covert capacities can lie um, underneath the surface of the water. And then some of these uh, capacities include things like language processing to understand uh, the movies or na narratives or other tasks that we might have given them, uh, working memory to know what the, the meaning of, of the words would be, sustained attention to continue to, um, to, to do the task for a period of time, but also more complex abilities such as emotion and new memory formation. And in interim summary, because- uh, Five minutes left. Five minutes left, thank you. Because um, 
a number of the cohort studies have found that one in five to six patients who are entirely behavior non-responsive will respond uh, with this advanced neuroimaging assessments. A new nosological distinction has been proposed, cognitive motor dissociation, meaning that some patients might uh, have motor disruptions and other related problems that uh, prevent them from being able to express the full extent of cognition and awareness that they retain. And so, so the question is, what are some of the ethical implications of this work then? Um, a large part of my research program focuses on ethical implications of covert awareness and these types of assessments, and I can go into them briefly here, but uh, we have written extensively and developed a framework for communicating results with families and medical teams, and uh, particularly doing this through an extended consent, uh, consenting process, both prior to studying enrollment and further at the end when the results come in, so that uh, families have the option to change their mind and to reflect deeply on tricky uh, issues and the, the significance of potential results. Negative results are an interesting, uh, I guess, complex issue because obviously uh, 80 or more percent of patients who don't respond, a proportion of them will be genuinely unaware and a proportion of them will also not show activity uh, due to maybe being fatigued, falling asleep in the scanner, or uh, fading in and out of consciousness, not mastering their necessary resources to respond as we would expect to detect it. Similarly, prognosis is a big issue, and uh, Dr. Amos uh, touched on this. Uh, the families and, and medical teams, in order to make the medical decisions, want to know if a, a result of covert awareness now, what does that mean for uh, at time A for uh, prognosis and functional recovery at time B? This is an area of active research, including in my group, uh, but we don't have the evidence base at the moment to make those determinations. So this needs to be communicated with families. And then strategies for improving quality of life. So some of this research suggests that we need to redouble our efforts to uh, interact with patients in a meaningful way, uh, in include them in social interactions, especially those that reconfirm sense of self-worth and expose them to stimulated environments. Um, this is a picture of an uh, international symposium on ethical implications for covert awareness that I organized last year at TCD, and we have the representatives there of uh, St. James's Hospital, Beaumont, uh, and uh, the National Reputation Hospital, and we're actively involved in this area, so please do get in touch if you have an interest in this space. So in summary, I have discussed very briefly some work that suggests that some patients retain very highly preserved levels of awareness despite appearing to be in a vegetative state. Neuroimaging can help to improve clinical diagnosis. I haven't had the chance to cover some lovely work that we are now doing where we've shown to translation of these markers to, to portable technologies for bedside testing. And I've touched on some implications for standard of care and quality of life. Thank you very much for the opportunity.